Jordan, welcome to This Is Horror Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. How y'all doing? Yeah, doing good, thank you. Mm-hmm. I know, to begin with, let's talk about any life lessons that you learned growing up in Missouri. And they don't have to necessarily pertain to writing, but just anything that you learn in those formative years? Wow, that's an interesting question. You know, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, the novel Winter's Bone uh, by Daniel Woodrell, which is um, the great novel of the Ozarks, in my opinion. And uh, in the very uh, beginning chapters, Ree Dolly, who's the 17-year-old girl, is at the the center of that book. Uh, She's watching her neighbors hang up a deer carcass outside. their neighbor's house and, and re and her little brothers are, are hungry. They don't have enough food. And, and her little brother says, maybe we should go over there and ask them for some of that deer meat. And uh, re grabs the boy by the ear and she twists it. She says, never ask for anything that ought to be offered. And I don't think that's a healthy lesson necessarily mm. to be taught by the Ozarks, but it was really a moment when I knew that the writer knew the area because it was a lesson that I'd never had anybody say to me but that I understood intrinsically as being part of like the culture that was just part of me at that point. That like, if, if somebody is supposed to, to help you, you, um, they should help you. And you, and you, if you have to ask, you are imposing on them. And I think, again, I'm not actually, you know, I guess you are looking for actual like wisdom, but to me, that's just, that's that individualist strain of the Ozarks that, that I, I carry along with me. Uh, and I'm actually trying to get over it and, and make myself more comfortable with asking people for things and, and, mm. and intruding because I think that there's a lot of that character that is, is about being self-sufficient unto like letting yourself go hungry just because the other people, if they, if they offered it, you would take it, but it's, you're too proud to, to ask for it. And I think um, to turn that into a lesson and particularly a writing lesson. One thing I think I'm pretty good at is writing about the difference between what people say and what they mean. Mm. And, and, and that there's an entire language in, in people that happens underneath the surface. And in fact, most communication happens underneath the surface. And I think there's a lot of writers who maybe imply, you know, that there's more under the surface, but I'm somebody who's always trying to find the thing that is being said under what is being said. And so I do think the, the Ozarks in a weird way and not a totally healthy way actually kind of trained me to, uh, to do that. Um, but you know, it also taught me, uh, you know, I, especially when it comes to fiction, I talk a lot about my grandfather who was a prison guard who made knives in his spare time. And he, uh, he taught me how to, how to play poker. He gave me chewing tobacco at a rodeo when I was seven years old you know, and he taught me a lot of great ways to swear. Um, you know, when I, when I beat him at poker, he'd say, you're luckier than a three peckered preacher. Um, which there's a lot going on in that phrase really. Cause it kind of, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it says a lot about the, the Ozark attitude towards religion before <laughs> the modern era. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, and I just, uh, I really like growing up where I grew up. I do think that, um, it's changed a lot in the last, you know, 30 years, but, um, there is like a, uh, there is like an Ozarks characteristic that I've, I, I've seen in other places, but, um, that, that is like, again, it is the, the good sides of being self-sufficient and rugged and, and not that I'm particularly rugged, but, uh, you know, um, all of that stuff I think is, is great. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's given me a great perspective on the world because you're from a place that not many people even know exist. And so you're, you're always coming to places as an outsider in a lot of ways. And I think as a writer, I I like that feeling. I like coming from the outside. Yeah. And I'm wondering how having this kind of never ask for what should be offered mentality served you or perhaps even disadvantaged you when you were both working in advertising, but then also working in Hollywood, because these are both industries where you kind of have to ask, you have to put yourself forward a lot. So it's, it's like completely the opposite mindset. So how was that dynamic? 
Well, I mean, specifically to, to Hollywood, you're exactly right. It's, it's, a, it's a total disadvantage. It is, um, if I was building a TV writer, like if there was a role-playing game uh, mm. based on being a TV writer and I was trying to build a successful character, I would min-max my attributes and put most of the points into uh, ambition and pushiness. Because yeah. those those are really um, the it is it's you're exactly right those are exactly the wrong lessons to to learn uh, and kind of come out to Hollywood because people who go out and hustle and ask and push and make assumptions and present themselves as ready to be given great things that doesn't work for everybody uh, but it, it that is the better attitude to come into Hollywood with for sure as opposed to the um whether you're talented or not and, and this is not a comment on me but like uh you know they well i'm just going to do great work and then they will beat their way to my doors because of just this great work that i'm doing which i think is a lesson a lot of struggling writers have to just deal with or, or beginning writers not, not necessarily struggling is um i always think about that scene in the wire which i think is uh when marlo steals the the lollipop and says you know, the security guard's like, why are you dissing me, man? Come on, have some respect for me. And Marlo says, you want it to be one way, but it's the other way. Mm. And uh, that, that, that's what I would tell a lot of writers who just think, well, if I write a great script, a great book, then success will find its way to my door. I, 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 don't, I don't see that in the, in the world that I live in and in, in the industry I work in. Uh, you have to, in one way or another, go out there and, and, be the face of your own work and and you have to be pushy in the system we have right now that's that's what we have yeah yeah and i I think it applies to publishing as well as hollywood i mean perhaps hollywood more so but i mean the the other day on social media and i periodically see things like this anyway there was a writer who was upset because they felt that they weren't getting a lot of opportunities that were coming their way or they weren't getting invited to things but like my experience is it's like no you you kind of choose yourself don't wait for the opportunity to come along because if you do that then you might be waiting forever you have to make the opportunity you have to have these conversations and it might not be something that some of us naturally feel comfortable doing but it's kind of what we have to do if we want to make it in writing and in this industry i think that that's exactly right and then the other the other ingredient to it which is the part that will drive people absolutely insane is that luck is an undeniable part of it yeah yeah um you know that you could be the go-getter with the great script and you could just not catch the right breaks and somebody else who's just like you catches the break and and that's life that is there is a contingency to all of this you know you, you hear about like the movies that got released on September 11th 2001 right like mm. um you know or albums or, or or video games anything that came out that week is gone you know like yeah. um and and that's part of life is just like somebody you know, had their big debut novel come out the week the moon landing happened. And then it's just like, nobody cared because <laughs> the moon landing happened. Like, and, and there's nothing you could do about that. And, and maybe people get rediscovered, but like, you know, I think about somebody like Jim Thompson um, yeah. in crime yeah. who could have very easily never been, you know, he died undiscovered. He died. Mm. And, and then, you know, I don't know. I don't actually, I, I should know more about this that I know at some point Barry Gifford was involved, but like, you know, with uh, Black Lizard publishing and all that, but like people found those books and re excavated them. But I promise you, or there are books, there's somebody out there who's as good as that who we we missed and never got that. Whether it's in crime or horror or sci-fi or something, there's somebody who has an entire career of amazing books from that era that are effectively lost and and may never be rediscovered. And it's at at some level, even if you're great and talented and do everything right, there's still just that piece of luck that it's unavoidable. Yeah, yeah. And it's so surreal, too, the amount of writers that are then discovered after their death. And it's like, you know, we, and as creatives, I mean, a lot of us are plagued with self-doubt anyway. But to, to think that it's like, well, 
you might be successful, but you'll never, ever know it because the success <laughs> is coming after you're gone. And it's, it's such, it's just such a bizarre notion. It, it, it is. And, and, and then there's the, the, I just rewatched this movie, this documentary. I don't know if you all have ever seen it called uh, Overnight. You ever seen Overnight. the documentary Overnight? It's, I don't um, think I have, no. It, it's about Troy Duffy, who was the writer and director of The Boondock Saints, which is a not very good crime thriller in like the kind of post-Tarantino era. Um, but he, he was in a band, and he had written this script, and he was a bartender, and somehow the script got to Harvey Weinstein, who made him this giant deal, and he was going to write and direct this movie, and his band was going to do the soundtrack, and he gets a couple of his buddies to start filming him because he's going to be such a big, huge star. And the documentary is not very well made, but what it captures on film is fascinating because you just see this man uh, who is given everything on a platter and instantly reveal himself to be a monster, just instantly. And I mean, I suspect he was already one and this just turned volume up, but uh, mm. it is watching a man go from the, to, you know, being working class guy to the height of success and then spoiler alerts back to being a working class guy in the space of five years. Um, yeah. He just totally, it's really, it's, it's on Tubi. Um, I think you can find it on YouTube. It's, it's not very well known, but I just rewatched it. I rewatch it every couple of years because it's a good thing when you work in Hollywood to not that I would ever be like that guy, but it's good to just see what that looks like to just be yeah. like, okay, okay. That's the other road. Let's not go down that road. Yeah, I guess it keeps you grounded as well and just reminds you, you know, how, how fleeting success can be. And I sometimes think about this in terms of just like with music, like the amount of like singles that at some point were really, really successful, but then the band or the artist just kind of disappeared. Like I, I think about this a lot with stuff from the 90s, like, I don't know if this was popular in America as well, but Babylon Zoo, Spaceman, that was absolutely huge in the, you see, you only in the UK then, so you, you're just like completely yeah. blanking on that. But that there's other things like, I guess, uh, Return of the Mac by Mark Morrison, oh. and it was just so big at the time, and that was it. I mean... Yeah, Mark, Mark Morrison's maybe not the best example because that dude well, did no, a lot they, of that. <laughs> but that song Go is on. great. And, and the it thing is. about that is, is that, is that, you know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's got a whole back catalog I don't know about, but I suspect yeah. were, my, were, him, were he to play live, there's going to mm. be an audience that is just kind of bored and looking at their watches until that song starts. Yeah, yeah. You know, Um like I did not go to this, but when I was in college, the band that did the theme song to the to Friends, the sitcom Friends, yeah, yeah, came yeah. and played a show at my college, and I, I mean, I wouldn't that that doesn't appeal to me, but like again, you go like if I was that band, I would probably play the Friends song first, right, and just be like, if that's what you came for, mm -hmm. there it is, and now we're gonna play other songs. If you're curious, stick around, um, yeah rather than having like a bunch of people glaring at you until you play yeah. the friends theme song. Um, uh, but you're right. I, with music, especially back then it, it was, you could like, maybe you got rich enough to buy a house, but maybe you didn't, maybe you just had yeah. one really cool four weeks in one summer where you were on the radio and then it, then it's gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think with, with the uh, concert, with the, band that did the friends theme tune and it, this shows that we don't even know the name <laughs> we just we know <laughs> that it was the band that did that the best way to do it is you should have just bookended the concert it's like right we're gonna open with it and we're gonna close yeah. with it so then that's like a reason for you to stick around otherwise i just Somehow imagine it... this mass exodus of everyone leaving <laughs> or you you figure out a way to like you play half of it <laughs> and then you kind of like segue in and, yeah. and you just play your other songs like a medley and then, yeah. and then you finish. Yeah. With the second half. Yeah. Um, yeah. Short concert. I bet it's a short concert, right? They're not, they're not doing three hour sets. I don't think. 
Yeah. This isn't a rush or a dream theater gig. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or, or they're an amazing band. Because, you know, I'm sure that you guys also probably have bands that you're fans of, that there are other people who only know the one song. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the 90s alt-rock band Ween, uh, who are barely known to anybody. If they're known, they're known by a really annoying song called Push the Little Daisies that um, is, you know, their one hit. The Flaming Lips are the same way. I'm a big Flaming Lips fan. And there's mm. a lot of people who only know them for the Vaseline song. And they actually, they have a big, a huge catalog. I guess they got more popular later on, but for a long time, that was all people knew of them. And I know people who are huge fans of Midnight Oil, who did Beds Are Burning, uh, which is the only song by them I've ever heard in my life. But I have a couple of friends who have seen them like 12 times in concert and so I guess that's if that's your life and, and, you know, you get a few extra people at the shows because you had that one hit, but also you have a hardcore fan base. That's maybe the best of both worlds. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I like, think so. Like make your money, but have your like real art that you get to do most of the time. Right. Well, I mean, this is what a number of actors do as well you know they take the big paying gig and then they do the kind of artistic thing that they actually you know care about or or care about more let's say you know it's more the passion project right the uh what is the phrase uh one for them one for me that's, yeah uh, yeah exactly yeah exactly and uh i mean that's if you can pull that off i do think you know or um or there's like the Beatles model where you become the most popular band in the world and then go, great, now I can do literally anything I want. Yeah. Which has some appeal to it as well. <laughs> yeah. Being the most popular band in the world has a little appeal, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it sounds like it's a, it's a good strategy, but, you know, the first obstacle is becoming the most <laughs> popular in the world. <laughs> so it's, you know, you, yes. you, you probably get people angry if you wrote a kind of how-to guide and that was one of the steps. <laughs> like, what? That's true. Step one, become most popular yeah. band in the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's like um, I paid but again, $20 you know, you talk- for this. <laughs> you know, that's where, you know, to go back to like that idea of like contingency and luck, sometimes I think about like if Jimi Hendrix was born 30 years later than he was, mm he couldn't become the world's greatest guitar player because yeah. And I'm not putting him down, but he, he was who he was at the right moment for the world to have. It's the guy who could find out all the weird things guitars could do. But like if somebody mm. that talented was a guitar player today, people wouldn't care. They'd be like, Oh yeah. He, he would like make a living. It's something he would yeah, make yeah, a living, yeah. but it's just like the, the, the time for the world's greatest guitar player to be a big deal is, is over. And I think, that that part of life again is is understanding that like it's not just being talented it's being talented at the right thing at the right time and like um and you can't again you cannot control that he just happened to like to exist in exactly the right moment to be Jimi Hendrix which again he's a genius i'm not putting him down but i'm saying again i just i'm always fascinated with the idea of, of people who could have been that and then you know uh got into jazz in the 1960s you know as opposed mm. to getting into rock and roll and then Okay, yeah, you can be Herbie Hancock if you get into jazz in the 1960s, but you can't be Miles Davis because we've yeah. already had that era, mm. you know. Um, and then it's it's if you think about it too much, it's easy to get depressed because you go, well, what, what's left? Like tw- Twitch streams? Like, <laughs> like we haven't had the <laughs> Jimi Hendrix of Twitch streams yet, I think. So, um, and that's not going to be me. Yeah, man. What? Not that what I think I'm a, a genius in any way. <laughs> What a paradox that sounds like the Jimi Hendrix of Twitch dreams. But I hope someone's listening who is going to prove me wrong. And it's like, motherfucker, <laughs> you're about to find out. <laughs> this is how we twitch. I don't know if it's a verb. But <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I, I, I learned about this thing. And this is this is me being an old man and learning about something after the fact. This this. This, I guess you would call it a YouTube show, but it's very weird. It's called Pets Cop. Right. And Pets Cop is a fake playthrough of a video game that becomes sort of a horror story over the course of like three or four hours and multiple episodes. And it was made by a guy actually building a fake video game and then acting it out. Uh, and a lot of it is just this weird little duck creature, whatever it is, walking 
but it's walking through all these weird things and then unexp- it's like the game it's like the concept basically is that it's a haunted video game uh, mm-hmm. that this guy has found and is playing but it is done like a, it's done strictly like a video game playthrough and it gets very very weird by the end and again as somebody who's like not part of that generation and doesn't watch video game playthroughs i had the sense of watching something from like art from people who were like younger than me and and that that like we're doing something i i couldn't quite fully comprehend and never would have thought of myself which is really fascinating so is this like one one video one playthrough or are there numerous fake video game playthroughs <laughs> well this one i think they're like 19 episodes all together and and some right. of them are very long and, and hard to understand but i'm sure that it must have be part of a genre right like i don't yeah. know yeah um um but it, it's presented as like one playthrough that just keeps going and again starts to feel like it's sinking into the real world and like mm. i don't know it's very interesting it, it's really it, again i had the sense to me of something new which is so yeah. thrilling when you find something that feels actually like authentically new yeah and then it, it's it, is the video call. game itself fake or are, are they taken to make it even trippier a real video game but somehow mashing it up so it becomes a fake version of a real thing that exists i mean <laughs> i mean there must be versions of that too but no i think he yeah. like literally if i understand and again this is i'm so out of my depth here but that he he programmed his own video game and then yeah. when he is acting it out he is like it's not it's not an a- animation that he plotted it's that he he created the game and then it's walking yeah. through it. So he's like doing it with a controller, you know. Um which is fascinating again like uh and and a bunch of skill sets that I I have no knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, got... yeah, it's called Pets Cop, so. And it's we're going to watch this and we're going to put a link to this mm-hmm. in the show notes. What what an, in, yeah. what an insane idea and and to also mm-hmm. have all those skills and to make a video of a fake playthrough rather than just release the game. <laughs> yeah. <is> dedication. Also <laughs> the, it's, uh, you know, but that's like, that's that part of the internet that is going away a lot is like mm. the internet was used to be more of a place where people would just do their weird things that, that, yeah. that interested them. And, uh, and just, you know, and again, I believe if I, if I've got the story correct, that he basically, he created it. And then just dropped a link of it on some some subreddit and was just yeah. like, "Hey, look at this game playthrough I found," and like and let <laughs> like there was no advertising yeah. or anything like that. Just let it build totally organically, which I really dig. That it's very different than anything I do, but like I yeah. really dig that. And, and funnily enough, this comes back to the idea of people being discovered or not being discovered, because I'm sure there's a load of people who have done a similar thing and they dropped the link and nobody commented on it. Like, what, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> You're totally right. It, and it's yeah. just like, well, we were trying to be underground. It's like, well, you got, you did it. You're real yeah. underground. Cause yeah. Nobody clicks on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But well, you mentioned, um, yeah, no, it's you know, you, oh, go ahead, no, go ahead. Well, no, 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 you go ahead. <laughs> I've lost it now. That's why I'm okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I, I was gonna say you, you were talking before about your grandfather and obviously how he was a big influence on you growing up, and it's also my understanding that your interest in crime fiction goes back to your grandfather as well, and specifically the Young Brothers Massacre in 1932. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, no, wow, yeah. Um, So the Young Brothers Massacre was the largest loss of law enforcement life in American history until 9-11 in any one incident. Mm. And it was these two brothers, uh, the Young Brothers, who were car thieves uh, outside of my hometown. And they, they had like a car theft ring from the Ozarks to Austin, Texas that they were doing. And they had murdered a, a marshal uh, in a small town outside of Springfield. And then they had gone on the run. And then this rumor came that the young brothers were at their family home. And so the sheriff put together a posse of like active duty cops and some people who were off duty um, who had been fired recently, but they brought them in just for this one day. And one of those people was my great grand uncle. Uh, and they went out to the family house and it was, you know, this was a long time ago and the cops, they each had 
a revolver a piece with six bullets a piece. They didn't carry extra bullets or anything like that. And uh, they knocked on the door and nobody answered. And the sheriff opened the door and got shot in the face with a shotgun. And then the guys inside the house just opened fire and they had rifles and shotguns. And uh, the people on the outside all had six shooters that they emptied almost instantly, just in like defensive fire. Uh, and they got picked off one by one. And I think if I, it's either six or seven, but I believe it's seven, seven police officers killed. And, uh, and then the two brothers got away and there was a huge manhunt and they ended up, uh, killing each other while surrounded by cops in Austin, Texas. And they just, I mean, they kill each other as in like a, a joint suicide pact of just like they shot each other. And, mm. uh, so like I said, my great grand uncle, Ollie Crosswhite was one of those cops. And so my great grandfather, who was a prison guard helped fund this little booklet uh, on the Young Brothers Massacre that local reporters wrote and they printed it up and uh, it was really dark and, and violent and pulpy and, and, and written with like, you know, the bullet sizzled and, and all caps for sizzled through his brain pan as it exited through the back of his skull and things like that. And uh, I, these books were always floating around my family and I read it when I was really young. And uh, I really think that had a, a tremendous amount to do. And my grandfather was kind of the guy who, who taught me about it. And I think it has a lot to do with why I've always been really interested in, in violence and, and crime mm. as, as, as vectors of storytelling, because like, not only was I exposed to this as a young man, but I was also told it was really important, you know, that, 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 that this story was important. And so I've always kind of held on to that. I, I've meant for my entire career to write a novel or something like that about the young brothers massacre. Mm. But I, I haven't yet. I don't know if I'm building towards it. I don't really know what it would be yet. Um, but I would like to write about it someday. Um, and, you know, also just, you know, my, like my grandfather was also a prison guard and he told me stories mm -hmm. about Bonnie and Clyde, like kidnapping the sheriff in his hometown when my, when my grandfather was a boy and everybody in the town thought the sheriff was a pussy because he, you know, he got in the car with Bonnie and Clyde and they let him go at the other side of town. And, and uh, he had to walk back in and tell his story. And I think he ended up losing his job, but I could, I could be making that part up, but, uh, so I just kind of grew up steeped in this stuff and, and, um, and, you know, mob movies and gangster rap mm. and nineties crime films and all that. And I just always was really drawn to, to that as, as, you know, what I found interesting and, 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 you know, I drew comic books and I wrote, you know, monster stories and things like that. But I always, even as a little kid wrote crime stories and, and gangster stories. And so it's, it's been one pretty unbroken line through most of my life. Uh, about what I'm interested in, you know. Yeah, yeah. And w was your grandfather the main person raising you, or did you just spend a lot of time with him? No, I mean, I had my. I was I, I was raised by my parents, and and obviously they had a big influence on me as well. Um, but I just, you know, the main thing they did for me, other than, than being just really good parents, was um, is encourage me to believe that I could be a writer, even though nobody involved knew what that meant. I mean, mm. not that we were like ignorant. I don't mean that in like the like, what's well, a writer. I mean it in a very specific, like, you know, now that I'm in Hollywood and, and, and I work with people, some of whom have parents in the industry or, or just grew up in LA, the idea of being a TV writer isn't a completely foreign idea to them. They see people who do it. Like, I really desperately, the other thing I wanted besides crime fiction in my life is I really wanted to be Hunter S. Thompson for a long time. Right. Uh, particularly when I was in high school and college, that mm -hmm. was more what I was hoping to be was take a lot of drugs and write cool things yeah. about taking a lot of drugs. Um, but even that I didn't really, and you know, you mentioned earlier I worked in advertising and that, that yeah. was, certainly was not any passion in my, on my part. Like it was, well, I always, all I knew how to do well was write and like, what can you do? And like, well, we knew people who worked in advertising in my hometown. We didn't know anybody who was a novelist or a screenwriter or anything like that. So that's just, that's kind of what I fell into mm -hmm. uh, after I left college. And, um, and so that, I mean, that's why I did that. And, that, and then a few years after doing that, I, I was in St. Louis and I was writing uh, music reviews on the side again, like kind mm -hmm. of, uh, always been a big fan of music and, uh, and the, the person who ran the local alt weekly, uh, who ran the music section quit after I'd been writing reviews for about two years. And I, so I actually became like, as a full-time music critic for a few years. And, and that kind of opened up my mind to the idea that like, Oh no, 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 you can like, 
you don't have to just do this for fun. I was writing music reviews mostly for fun and with a little, mm. sometimes I got paid for them and sometimes I didn't. Uh, but the idea that no, no, you can actually do something for money that you also really enjoy and like place your strengths. Uh, that job was what taught me that. Yeah. Yeah. And then what was the moment where you realized or perhaps were presented an opportunity where you could go from obviously this kind of nonfiction salesy writing like advertising to actually writing fiction and screenwriting and being immersed in that world well you know uh the the other reason i bring up my grandfather in in all of these uh in the story is because um you know he while i was uh working as a as a music critic and uh immediately afterwards uh, right around that time period uh my grandfather and johnny cash both died in a fairly close mm -hmm. proximity to each other and I'd always associated Johnny Cash with my grandfather. They're about the same age. They were both, you know, hard case guys. They kind of looked alike. And, uh, and you know, my grandfather was a big fan. And, and, and I think he embodied a lot of that stuff that Johnny Cash sang about. Uh, and, um, and so I, I wrote this short story called Johnny Cash is Dead about a uh, retired prison guard whose granddaughter is raped and uh, the, the rapist is set free and he's not going to see any justice. And this old man like climbs up three flights of steps to confront, you know, her, her uh, his granddaughter's rapist. And I, I bring up the three flights of stairs because he's old enough that that in and of itself is a feat to get up the mm. three flights of stairs to confront this guy. And it was the first real piece of crime fiction I or any kind of fiction that I wrote as an adult. And uh, I knew that it was good and I knew I needed to do something with it. And I had just left St. Louis where I was a music critic and moved to New York where I worked as like a film critic and did a little music criticism. And, uh, I found a, a website called Thuglet, which, mm. um, had just begun. Now it's like a pretty famous in the, in crime fiction circles as, as a launching pad for a lot of, of, of great people. Uh, but it was brand new. They just published their very first episode issue online. And I submitted that story and, uh, Todd Robinson, the guy who ran Thuglet published it. And, uh, and then I met Todd cause he lived in New York and he became my friend and we were in a writing group together. So I write more and more crime fiction, uh, and really started to get a feel for, for what I, what I wanted to do. Uh, and, and Todd and, and Thuglet published seven or eight of my short stories over the next couple of years. And I published more crime stories other places and, and really just started to understand that that's what I wanted to do. And then eventually moved from New York to Los Angeles um, I was tired of being a music critic. I wasn't very good at being a movie critic because I wanted to write movies. And I think that's a pretty bad place to come from when you're a critic is it, it can be, there are people who pull it off. But in my case, I was bitter. I was like a guy who'd be like, well, they didn't really pull off the second act break. And, and like, mm -hmm. because I wanted to write movies, I was like being hypercritical in a way that was not good. It was not good that I did that. And at least I recognized it myself. And, and said, okay, I need to take a shot at, um, at doing this. And so me and, uh, my, well, my now ex-wife, but, uh, we moved to Los Angeles and I took one of the other short stories I'd written and I turned it into a spec script, uh, for like an episode of the shield. I made it an episode of the shield, which is my mm. favorite TV show of all time. And, uh, use that, uh, I had been told about this thing called the Warner brothers writers workshop where they would Warner brothers would train you to be a TV writer. And what you had to do to get in is you had to write a spec script for a TV show and then enter it in. And, um, you know, back then it was very competitive. It was like something like a thousand people entered and they took 10. So that's like really competitive. But now they're, they're shutting it down now. They, they just announced with all the Warner Brothers budget cuts that they're um, shutting it down. But um, that, uh, but now even before they shut it down, it was getting where there were like eight or 9,000 people applying every year and they were still only taking 10. So it really got out of control. But I, at least when I got in, it was a great program and they trained us to be TV writers and they sent us out on job interviews and helped connect us with Warner brothers TV writers, which is where I got in uh, with a man named Bruno Heller who created a lot of great shows. He created Rome. Uh, he created Gotham, but the one I worked with him on first was um, the mentalist where I worked mm. for six years. Um, and wrote 14 episodes of The Mentalist and then went on to work with Bruno at Gotham too. Uh, but that was really, I mean, I, 
I've said this before, but I, I feel like I got paid to go to grad school by mm. uh, getting to work on a TV show with, with a lot of very smart people who kind of taught me story structure. And even if like, I mean, I'm not a fan of case of the week network mystery shows particularly, but they're incredibly good training for writing because you learn there. It's like learning how to write really structured poetry where even if you don't want to write that, even if you want to write free verse, I think it's really, really important that poets learn how to write really structured poetry first, because that's the discipline. And then once you have that mastered, great, go on, do whatever you want. But 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 learn the, you know, like Picasso learned how to draw like architecturally normal things mm. and then became Picasso. He didn't just start as Picasso. I think it's really great to have some kind of like you know, discipline at the heart of what you do and then, and then go nuts. And so I'm really grateful for the mentalist for giving me that, like giving me that like base to work from. Yeah. And in terms of the timeline, I know that you were a co-producer for the mentalist in 2013, and you also released your short story collection, American Death Songs in 2013. So I have to imagine that both of these things were kind of going on simultaneously but what what's the kind of timeline is it that you were working on the mentalist first and then you started working on the collection or was it more the other way around so please talk on no, that it was the other way it was it was the other way around it was that you know a lot of that collection was the stuff that i written for thuglet and other magazines right. and so i came to hollywood with those already in place and mm. i'd also written uh, i had written a novel uh, at that same time that I'm not being cute or modest was very bad. Um, it was my bad novel that I had to get out of the way. Yeah. Uh, and very few people have, have ever read it or ever will. Um, and I, I, but I had, you know, like I said, I, the mentalist, while it was very valuable and I love the people I work with, it was not my kind of show. And I was starting to feel really chafed by like the moral and content, you know, uh, conditions or, or restrictions that I was working under on the mentalist. Mm. And so my first way out of that was to self American death songs was completely self-published. I, uh, I put that all together myself. I hired the book designer uh, and I just put it out on, on Amazon. Um, and, you know, it was, it was very much a reaction to working on the mentalist. It was, uh, and I think doing that was helped what helped kickstart me working on the novel that became she Ride shotgun. Uh, but while I was, I, I did all that while working on The Mentalist, especially after I'd been on The Mentalist for a few years and we got into a cycle of, I knew when I would be very busy and I knew when I wouldn't be. If I wasn't specifically writing an episode, uh, I had more time to work on my own stuff. So it became kind of, uh, kind of, it became kind of punctuated. And, uh, and so I published American Death Songs and then uh, my agent, who's still my agent today, Nat Sobel, uh, who is like the lion of crime fiction. Uh, literary agents. He's been a lot of people's literary agents over the years, uh, including James Elroy. Um, and uh, he found American Death Song. Somebody sent it to him and he was like, oh, we could have published this. Like, why did you self-publish this? We could have published it. So he took it out. He sold it. And he said, well, why don't you write a two page description of a novel and uh, I'll sell it as a two book deal. I was like, that's crazy, but okay. And <laughs> I had already, like I said, been sketching out what became She Ride Shotgun. That was mm. not the, the working title. Uh, so I wrote a two-page description of She Ride Shotgun, and, and we put together a short story collection, and uh, uh, and he sold it. And that was how I kind of got into publishing, was that I, I didn't think anybody could sell a crime fiction short story collection in those days. Um, short stories are just so much less popular than they used to be uh, in this country. But, um, but he did sell. I mean, you know. I guess they're sort of pop not popular here in as far as I can tell, because my he did manage to sell my short story collection in France. Um, and I think sh the art of the short story is completely unknown in France um, to the point where I read like a, I read like a bad and this is unhealthy behavior, but I was reading Google reviews of my books, like right. running them through Google Translate because they were in French. And, and one of the people was like, this isn't a novel. It's more just like a, a collection of things that happen to different people. And, and, and little, every chapter is just and was, like the guy had literally had literally never heard of a short story collection. So um, that's just an aside. I find that really interesting that, that uh, 
um, especially considering how much they love books and how mm. strong supporters they are of crime fiction in France. Um, so, um, yeah, that was, um, but, you know, Nat got it started and then I managed, I, I left the mentalist. I followed Bruno over to Gotham and mm. that's where I finished. She rides shotgun was at Gotham and, uh, I'd been working for Bruno for a long time at that point. I didn't like Gotham as much as I, I like the mentalist. And we kind of, we parted ways um, after I'd done two seasons on that show. And, uh, and by that point, she ride shotgun came out pretty quickly after that. And then I was just kind of off to the races at that point. Yeah. And when you say you didn't like Gotham as much as the mentalist, do you mean aesthetically as a TV show? Do you mean the experience working on it? Do you mean a little bit of both? I mean, a, a little bit of both. And I have to, to caveat that because I did meet my partner, Megan, uh, Megan Mawson Brown, who's also a TV writer on that right. show. We were both in the writer's room. So I, I yeah. can't diss the experience. Uh, that part's great. But, but there were a lot yeah. of other parts about it uh, that weren't great. Uh, I think maybe in later seasons, they kind of figured out what the show was while I was there. I think there was a lot of confusion between the writers about what kind of show we were making and what the tone mm. was. Uh, and I think. Also, I had been, like I said, I've been working for Bruno for a long time. And I think I had an idea for what I wanted Gotham to be, which by the way, it wasn't my call. Like it was Bruno's show. It wasn't my show. But like, I had an idea of what I thought it should be that I kept pushing for and that didn't mm. fit on the show. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, it just didn't work. I just, I, I needed to move on to, I think I'd been doing network TV at that point for eight years straight. And, and that's a lot of work. You make 24 episodes of TV a year, which like, you know, in modern era barely happens at all anymore. And now it's everything's eight episodes, 10 episodes. But, um, uh, so I think I was also pretty tired and, and, and so, uh, I, I left, I left, and I haven't worked in network TV since I've been trying to work in cable and streaming ever since then. Mm. Yeah. And of course there's, I said before you worked as a co-producer and a supervising producer, of course, for LA Confidential as an executive producer. So I, I'm wondering, and I think this will be of interest to our listeners, what are the specifics that are required of each role and how much control or lack thereof do you have in each of those producer roles? That's an interesting question, and, and, and the answer is a little complicated, but the, the, the basic answer is there was a time in Hollywood where all of those titles meant very specific things, and you would right. start as the staff writer, and the staff writer was the junior writer on the set. And uh, Well, actually, to really get in the history of it, it gets very complicated, but um, eventually now they're just almost more like belts in a, in a martial art where right. you start as a, you start as a, uh, as a staff writer and then you become a story editor and then you become an executive story editor and then you become a co-producer and then a producer and then a co-executive producer and then executive producers like your black belt. And yeah. that's sort of all it means now it is, you know, you're in a writer's room, you have everybody uh, is in the room at the same time and we're all talking, but there is a, a hierarchy of experience that kind of way there's a lot of also just hierarchies that are bad in TV rooms sometimes, but like there is a general, like, you know, the executive producers. And then there's the, the term that I'm sure everybody's heard of showrunner, which mm. is not an official title. You don't see showrunner on IMDb or anything like that. That's just a term of art of the guy who's like in charge of the show, like where the buck stops. So executive producer can just mean that you are one of the senior writers on the show. Um, or it can mean that you're deeply involved in the production and you're going to some production meetings and helping with casting and you're staying on for the filming. Uh, so th really the terms are a little meaningless to the point where I've never really cared about them too much. Um, and um, because, you know, there have been times where like, oh, they don't want to give you this title. They want to give you a lower title. And, and I would always ask my agents, well, are they paying me like the upper title? And they go, yes. And I go, then I don't care. Yeah, like what, because it really doesn't matter that much at the end of the day. It's it's um, uh, especially now I've been doing it for, you know, 14. Yeah, about 14 years, I guess, um, if my math is good. Um, and uh, and so, like, I'm experienced. I'm a black belt, you know, like I, I have, right. 
I have done that. And um, I'm an executive producer and co-showrunner on the show that I'm on right now that I, I can't name, unfortunately, because it hasn't been announced yet. Um, mm-hmm. I'll tell you guys about it off air. But, um, yeah. you know, uh, and, and showrunner, that means something. Like, that's a, that's a meaningful title. But, like, the rest of them, it, it, it really is. When you see those titles scroll past the screen, um, it really is just an indication of seniority at the end of the day. And, and so I went up most of that ladder while I was on the mentalist and it was just, I was there for six years. And so mm-hmm. I didn't get six promotions cause it doesn't quite work like that. Sometimes you spend more than one year. At, but again, that's all, there's no regimentation. There's no test you have to pass. You don't have to, you know, ace the Lieutenant's exam or anything like that. It's just like, okay, well your, your contract requires you to be bumped up to the next level when we start the next mm-hmm. season. Okay. You know, and and, yeah. uh, and so yeah, it's it's it, like I said. I think it now it's, it used to mean something, but now it's it, it doesn't mean quite as much. Yeah, yeah. And as I name dropped LA Confidential, I know there'll be listeners who are like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! You you got to pick up a little bit more <laughs> on that." Yeah. So I, I'm wondering. <laughs> I mean, of course. Firstly, how did that come about? And most importantly for listeners, do you have any news? Is there a possibility that we might see this LA Confidential series? Um, well, I mean, to be a bummer and get to the bad news first. No, it's pretty much dead at this point. I mean, it's, we mm-hmm. shot the pilot in 2018. And, you know, never say never. If they gave me the chance, I, w- I would happily do it. At this point, mm-hmm. what I'm really hoping for is for it to be, get released just as, you know just as the pilot so people can see it because I'm very proud yeah. of it. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'd been writing in TV for a while and this was not too long after I'd left Gotham. Uh, and I'm a huge, you know, as a crime fiction person, I am a huge James Elroy fan to the point that my dog is named Elroy. Uh, and I love, I used to just rewatch LA Confidential, the movie over and over again. And I've read the book. I don't know how many times I've read that book. I just reread it again a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, mm. And so, you know, I was submitted along with a lot of other writers to to be somebody who could have, New Regency Films wanted to turn it into a TV show. Those are the people who own the rights to it. And I got submitted along with a lot of other people. And uh, I had they had submitted as my sample to say why I should write LA Confidential. My agents had given New Regency a script. I had written a pilot called Surf City Hardcore, which was a very Elroy-esque story that I had written set in Huntington Beach, California, just outside of LA in the 1980s. So it was like an 80s update to like a James Elroy vibe. And so you know, the executive at, at New Regency, a man named Kevin Plunkett, um, responded well to that and saw that I kind of could do uh, a, a James Elroy. I don't think it was a, it wasn't like a pastiche of him, but it was in that area of just like complicated evil cops with great hard boiled dialogue but with punk rockers and crack cocaine and, and Nazi punks and things like that, yeah. it was, it was a fun script. Um, and so I came in and I met Kevin and I think the fact that I was able to show him a picture of my dog Elroy certainly helped. And I, and I pitched what I thought I would do if I could turn LA confidential into a TV show. And uh, he really liked it. And he said, okay, well, let's go out and try and sell it. And so he and I worked up a pitch and we took it up all around town and, you know, I mean, look, I don't mean I, I'm very grateful for CBS for for buying it, who which is who bought it and, and let us shoot the pilot. But obviously, our first intention was to sell it to somebody where we could do like a James Elroy hard R violent mm. bloody thing. And, and we weren't able to sell it there. And so, you know, there was an executive at CBS who really gave us our shot and let us try to do like the most mature, interesting, intellectual. Well, that makes it sound boring because it's not boring, but like. You know, they let us try and do LA Confidential on CBS and try and marry those mm. two worlds. And I got to say, I really, we did a screening of it one time for for friends of the cast and crew. And a, a guy who hadn't worked on the show came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I didn't notice there wasn't any swearing, um, which I take to be the big compliment is that, that we created something mm. on CBS or that could have ran on CBS uh, that had had fooled people into thinking they were seeing James Elroy. Um yeah. But no, you know, we wrote it, we, or I wrote it, and we shot it. A great director named Michael Denner directed it, um, who has done a lot of Justified and, and, and a mm. lot of other really great TV. And, and we got Walton Goggins in the, in the Jack Vincent slash Kevin Spacey role. 
a lot of other really great actors. In fact, I mean, I know this is a podcast, so this won't work for the listeners, but I'm going to scroll up here on my camera. If you can see that at the top there, that's a yeah. fake Hush Hush magazine mm-hmm. with, with Walton Goggins. Yeah. Uh, as, so yeah. Soon. That I, yeah, it's really cool that we use. That was a prop from the, from the pilot. And, uh, um, you know, and we were going to do it. We, I had a whole, I had five seasons mapped out of how to do the entire novel of LA Confidential with some changes and stuff, but we were going to do all the things that they left out of the movie and yeah. uh, you know, the serial killers and, you know, a lot of the other stuff that, uh, the, the fake Disneyland and the connection between the serial killer and the fake Disneyland yeah. and all that. Um, so look, if, you know, I, if, uh, if somebody called me tomorrow and said, Oh no, they want to do it. I would drop everything and I would run and go do it. I would love to, uh, if we could get as much of that cast back as possible, I would love to, if we can get Michael dinner involved, I'd love to. And, and me and uh, Kevin Plunkett, who's the executive involved and Michael dinner are, are trying to find something else to work on because we all had a really good time doing that pilot. And I think there, there is a, there is a, there's a specific kind of crime show uh, that I really wish was on the air so I could watch it. And that's what we were going to try and do. Uh, and, um, and so maybe someday, or I would love to, if somebody had wanted me to do any of the other Elroy things like white jazz or American tabloid, I would, I would die to do American tabloid yeah. for like mm-hmm. HBO. Um, yeah. I, that was I my first want- venture into uh, Elroy. Hmm. I got stuck on a JFK uh, rabbit hole and I had a buddy of mine who uh, I'll never forget this conversation. He took a piece of paper and held it in a joint in his mouth and said, this guy, American tabloid, get this and then read Don DeLillo. If you want to go down the JFK rabbit hole, this is where it's going to fucking take you. <laughs> so I, I went to the local bookstore and went down there. And I couldn't even, I mean, he, he wrote, he, he wrote Elroy. I, I would have never found it. I had to get creative because he couldn't spell good. Uh-huh. So, and, but I seen the book, I was like American tabloid. And I just, all I did was I read the back cover and then I couldn't find the Don, I couldn't find Libra. So I went and read, bought American tabloid and read it in three days. Yeah. And I was like, Dude, and so they're like I'm back at it, you know, and I'm I'm on I'm every bookstore in town. I'm like going, you got James Elroy, and they're like, well, he can't keep his stuff in stock. I'm like, no shit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, if you could do American Tabloid as a series, I don't I don't I don't see how it could ever be a movie. But that's that would be that would be really good. <laughs> it would be it would be really tough to get that all into a movie. That is oh, yeah. definitely at least a season of TV, if not more than one season of TV. Yeah. Um, no, I love it. And, and, and Libra too. And you know, it's the new addition to that, that, um, that canon that nobody is talking about is um, the new Cormac McCarthy book. Uh, the mm-hmm. passenger. Mm-hmm. There is a chapter near the end of it where the, the protagonist sits down with a guy who goes out of nowhere, not coming out of any other conversation, just goes super deep on the, Kennedy assassination and you're like wait what like what why are we why is like McCarthy's in this too like I love it I I want to go back and reread that chapter again Mm. and and kind of dig into because he's like he's full the mob killed JFK which I I if if you embrace his conspiracies which I'm agnostic on like Mm -hmm. uh, I find that one really hard to believe but like all right the CIA just seems like a better choice but again that you uh, whether any of that's true, but he gets into such detail about like the type of rifle that it was and what that would have done to somebody's head and how it had to have been like all this stuff is like, wait, this is what Cormac McCarthy thinks about too. Like, man, what it really, whether again, whether it's true or not, the fact that it obsesses like some of the greatest writers of of our Mm -hmm. times is really important and really worth talking about, you know? Oh yeah. Um, which this is a pivot here, but I got to tell you, like, you know, um, for me and what I'm working on right now, for me, the new version of that is Epstein. And like, right. you know, yeah. did Epstein kill himself? Did he not? Who was he working for? Was he really working for the federal government at some level? And again, I'm not saying any of that's true. I'm saying it makes fantastic fodder oh, for yeah. fiction. 
and people aren't taking it on yet. Like people I think are a little scared. They'll do like yeah. little head nods, like, Oh, that's a reference to an Epstein thing. But like, um, and I'm still not, I'm not using Epstein's name in what I'm writing. I'm not doing that full Elroy or Libra thing, but like, mm-hmm. cause it's a little too soon for that, I think. But like, um, I, let's just say I've been spending a lot of time reading his autopsy report and things like that um, while working on the new book. So, um, yeah, but I love all that. Again, whether or not it's true, it's important in a weird way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And th- this new book that you're working on, is this a follow up to Everybody Knows or is this a standalone or? Well, I really, and uh, you know, if they, if I have a problem with with my careers, I really do follow James Elroy in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways I'm following him is I am doing a follow up to everybody knows that does not have the same protagonists. Um, yeah, it's not going to be May and Chris uh, who are the, mm. the pra- protagonists of Everybody Knows. It's going to be a new group of people, but it's in the same world with the same villains, and it will mm. take place very clearly in the aftermath of Everybody Knows. But I really I always want to write my books where if you just start reading, um, if you start with a second book, I want people to enjoy it just as much as if they had already read Everybody Knows. I don't want to, it's not a sequel where you had to know that there was a book before it. And again, Mm. to to reference Elroy, Elroy's uh, quartet, like you can read White Jazz and not know, uh, and you read LA Confidential and not have read Black Dahlia and and you're Mm. fine. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. Um, and so that's sort of what I'm doing now is, is, is um, finding different angles. I've kind of said everything I had to say about the, the specific angles that, that May and Chris had into this world of like privilege and wealth and decay. Uh, and now I want to find other people who can kind of take us into this world and, and, ha- and have different looks and, and different takes. Because uh, if it was another, and we haven't really talked about everybody knows, but like, you know, May is a black bag publicist who doesn't get the good news out. She keeps the bad news in. Mm. And I think that was a really interesting way to talk about how information is disseminated in our culture and how much people really do control what we put in our heads, whether we know it or not. And, and, and trying to kind of explicate that as cleanly as possible. But I don't have another book's worth of things to say about that. Like that, Mm. what I put in the book was what I have to say about that. And now I'm trying to find, yeah, again, other, other, other weird careers that people have in today's world yeah. that like, you know, um, I'm very into like one of the characters uh, in this new one is a private concierge, which is a, it's like a less dramatic thing, but I, but it, that's not the drama of her story, but it's like, you know, um, like the people who just I'm fascinated with just the people who make things happen for these people. I'm way more interested in that than I am that like the people who are enjoying the weirdness or the, like you read about all these like weird Hollywood drug orgies that are sex parties and everybody's taking drugs and and fucking in some mansion. And I want to know about the person who had to rent the mansion, who had to like buy the lube, who had to like, you know, make sure all the sex workers were tested. Like, like mm. that to me is, that's the interesting thing is like the people who have to like still work in this world and do that job, you know? And, uh, and so like I'm spending a lot of time researching stuff like that right now. And, and what, like, what are the weird things that people are asking for? And like, you know, what are the things that nobody talks about? Those are, those are the things that really interest me right now. Yeah, there's a temptation to ask what's the weirdest thing you've undercovered in or uncovered, I should say, in your research for this. But perhaps you want to save that for me reading the actual book. (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of I have a long running file now of um, of just like news stories and rumors and things that I keep. And a lot of them went in the first book and, and, you know, the list has gotten longer since then, but like, um, everything from like, there was a sushi bar in LA a few years ago that got busted for serving whale meat. Right. Um, which is illegal in America, but just the idea Mm -hmm. that people want to eat whale and, and that they will arrange ways to do that. That's just like a little tiny one. Um, you know, uh, and everything from that to just the idea of, of, um, yeah, like the, the 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 kind of flights you can go on where people are weightless. Um, mm. 
to um, people who want to pay somebody a large sum of money so that they can go out and hunt and kill another human being, uh, which I kind of have some leads on ways that you go, well, nobody can really do that. And I have found some things that suggest, yeah, you know, and here's how you do it. And here's your legal cover. Um, and uh, I have found and that I am going to sit on because it's it's going in the book. But um, <laughs> but like, um, yeah, I, I figured out. I had somebody actually tell me a story about a Hollywood star and it's like, no, he goes out and he kills people and you go, what? And then when he said how he did it, you go, Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not good, but I get how you could get away with that. And um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm really getting, and again, there's, there's Epstein stuff and there's um, just everything that kind of makes our world go and, 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 cannibalism i'm interested in cannibalism right now because cannibalism's having a moment have you noticed Mm -hmm. i i I have yeah i never thought someone would quite put it like that on the podcast cannibalism (laughs) is having a moment but you 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 are right you are so right yeah it's been going on for a while (laughs) it has and and, and that's the thing about writing a book is so i'm writing the book now it probably won't come out till um 2025 you know, because mm-hmm. that's just how, like, I'm not going to finish it right away. Uh, and, and there's usually a year between turning a book in and it getting published. So anything I write won't come out till 2025. And, um, and so you're like, well, I hope the cannibalism moment doesn't end. Right. But right. like, I was worried about a lot of that stuff and everybody knows, and it would be like, well, I hope people still care about, oh, there's this big police brutality thing going on. Are people still going to care? It's like, don't worry. The cops are going to kill somebody else. Um, you know, oh, what about Me Too stuff? Are, are people going to be tired of that? Don't worry, there's going to be a new guy gets arrested for Me Too stuff every year. Like these things are eternal, but the cannibalism thing has really got some staying power. And so I, I'm dealing with that in this new book, but I'm also trying to ask the question of like, why? Like, why mm. are we all suddenly so interested in cannibalism? And, uh, and uh, when I work that out, I'll let you know. But like... Um, I have some theories, but it's like, again, that's like for the, the book stuff, but like, um, uh, these are like the, lot, you know, thematically, a lot of my work is just like about violence and why, like, and power and why, and like, uh, and the intersection of those things. The, the working title for this new book is, uh, this new violence. Mm. And, um, uh, because it does feel like violence, there's still the old kind of violence, but there's new kinds of violence coming in all the time. And, and uh, a really, the really good trick is when there's the kind of violence we don't even call violence. So that like, if something happens to you where you are oppressed and hurt and pressed down and fight back, suddenly you're violent because you're, you're the one who swung a fist first. Mm. But like, you know, but, uh, and again, it's, it's hard to talk about what those things are, but like, you know, a lot of things that I think are self-defense get characterized as violence because we don't characterize the instigation as violence, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, And I'm talking mostly about governments and things like that, that what things Mm -hmm. governments do that we don't call violence or say is fine violence that if anybody else was doing it, we would be like, Hey, I think that might be uh, something that people should fight back against, but I'm not, I, I can go down a rabbit hole that, you know, we'll, we'll start, we'll all be joining the red army by the end of this. So I'll, I'll, I'll pull up, but, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, your um, next book, I really wanted to read anyway, cause I absolutely love she <laughs> rides shotgun and everybody knows, but my mm. God, just what you said in the last five minutes, you've absolutely <laughs> sold it to me. <laughs> Even more, just giving us these little snippets of things that it's going to pack into it. And I'm, God, I'm so intrigued. It's just a shame that we have to wait a couple of years for it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying. But like, uh, you know, yeah. um, there are people who put out books every year. Um, and I admire those people a lot. And yeah. I, I'm never going to be one. I'm never. <laughs> uh, two years. Every two years is my goal right now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think to do the kind of work I do, I, I can't, I, you know, I mean, the amount of detail, like if you read, everybody knows the amount of yeah. just sheer information that's in that book, which mm. makes it sound boring, but I just mean the amount of scandals, the amount of different kinds of people. I can't come up with that. Even though I'm drawing a lot of it as fictionalized, true stories and things like that. I can't accumulate enough stuff to put into a book 
uh, every year. So I think that's a yeah. lot of it too, is, is giving myself time to like kind of reabsorb information that I, mm. I can now squeeze into a book. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think anyone could accuse everybody knows of being boring or if they were to, <laughs> then, you know, they'd be objectively wrong. Sorry, but <laughs> I mean, it, it's very, it's so tightly written. I mean, it almost reads like a screenplay at times. And I mean, I feel too that of, of course, like James Elroy has been an Im influence. He's permeated your career, but I, I kind of want to say this is the most Elroy book that you've written to date. Oh, I think that's totally fair. I mean, I almost dedicated the book to him and then yeah. was happy to dedicate it to, to uh, my partner instead. But, um, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I, you know, if somebody were to like say I'd gone too far in, in emulating him, I would, I would have to have that conversation of like, well, I'm trying not to, but I am, I am very much in this book in his debt and I am the next book I hope will be a little further away from Elroy. Right. This one is very much like, I mean, but we didn't really talk about this, that, that it was very much, I came out of the LA confidential pilot experience mm -hmm. with all of this, like James Elroy energy inside me. And I just spent a year like breaking down the novel LA confidential and plotting out all these intricate plots that were now useless. So we're never going to go anywhere. And it's not yeah. that I took those plots and put them in the book, but I, I still had this energy and this desire to do this really tight but epic L.A. story. And the big, the big twist that I think gets me off the hook for being too much like Elroy is that it's not set in the 50s. It's set right now. And I think mm. that is a, a huge difference. And again, I, I, if somebody says, well, you, but also you're, you're, you're like clearly drawing from his prose style. I've just been, yeah, I am. I, I am. Like, I'm not going to deny yeah that he's a huge influence on me, but like, I, I do think that I'm doing something new with it and that I have found a, uh, you know, a new field of snow to run in. Um, you know, I don't know if, if he read it and yelled at me, I, I would, I would go hide in a cave or something, but like, uh, you know, um, but no, I don't, I absolutely, I, I never hide my influence, uh, that mm. Elroy is, is my number one influence. I'm, I'm trying this next one, like I said, I, I, I'm reading more Cormac McCarthy. I'm, I'm trying to find if there's a fusion uh, between them and the other person that I, 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 people never comment about, but in my own work, I'm aware uh, of how much Megan Abbott I put into my work. Right. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Megan. Yes. But, um, uh, she is the person whose current crime fiction I admire the most. Uh, yeah. I think she's the best person putting out books right now. I just, I think her, her prose is so great and I just think she sucks you into the books and you just get totally in, inside the worlds that she puts you in. And so, and I, and, you know, I guess the other way you can see that is all of my novels, including I have a, a third novel called the last King of California. That's only been published yes. in the UK. Yeah. And uh, all of those novels had a male and female um, uh, protagonist and point of view character. Um, which I think differentiates me from most male crime fiction writers. But, um, and I don't think I'm going to stop that. I think this new book has two men and a woman. Um, but, and there's something, you know, and she writes Shotgun, the woman's in the, the main role in Last King California. Yeah. It's the man's story more. Uh, everybody knows it's more the woman's story. And then this one, I think, is going to be one of the man's stories, most of all. But, like, I don't know. There's something about doing both of those perspectives at once that I find really pleasing. So I think I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, with The Last King of California, what what's the kind of story as to why was it released only in the UK? And then for American listeners, is is it coming to the US? Is there going to be a publication? Is it in some weird publishing limbo right now? Um, no, you know, the answer is that you can buy it on Amazon if you live in America, which is not normally where I, sh I send people to buy books. You can also get it shipped from the UK from the book depository um, and uh, or Blackstones or Blackwells. I forget which one it is, but Blackwells. Uh, yeah, Blackwells. Um, Blackwells will ship it here. Um, but as of for right now, no, there's no plans. And, and it basically I had written a draft of the last king of California that I didn't think worked very well. And I put it in a drawer. This was after she ride shotgun. And then mm. uh, 
while I was writing Everybody Knows, I, I finished the first draft of that and I just put it aside. You always put your first drafts aside for a couple of weeks, you know, to uh, to let them rest. And in that period, I picked up The Last King of California and read it and went, oh, this is way closer to being done than I thought. And so I ended up putting Everybody Knows on a shelf for about six months and and finished Last King of California. And we sent it out to all the publishers in the U S and uh, none of the mainstream publishers wanted it. Um, I think it's a little darker. It's a little more literary um, than some of my other work. And there were some smaller presses that were interested in it and would have published it. But I knew that I had everybody knows coming down the pipe. And mm. again, this is just dumb rules of publishing. If you go from a mainstream publisher to a small house that is seen as taking a step down, whether that is or not, that's immaterial. The point is, I knew it would hurt everybody knows publication chances to go down to a smaller house. Mm -hmm. So I made the choice not to publish Les King of California in America for now and publish everybody knows, which has been much more commercial than my other books and it's doing better mm -hmm. than, than my other books. And so I guess uh, much like my friend S.A. Cosby just published his first novel, My Darkest Prayer, uh, just got re-released on a mainstream press now that he is a big fancy hotshot. Um, <laughs> I hope that maybe after this new violence, um, I, I can do the same thing with Last King of California and just, just put mm -hmm. it out as a paperback here in America. Uh, because I do understand, I mean, it is, it's really dark. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's literary. It, it has a main character who is, is not uh, a normal crime fiction guy he's like scared mm. and weird and and lonely and and sad and all these things that like don't get mainstream publishing really excited anymore um and i was a little i was a little bitter about it for a little while but like it's just again this is the game this is what happens and i still own it i can still do something with it so it will yeah. get published sometime but if somebody really wants to read it they should find a way of getting the british copy for right now because there's no plans in the immediate future for it to come here but someday i mean and again if 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 I publish a couple more books and I still can't get a post and I'll self publish it because yeah, I think we're going to see more of that in the future too. I know several crime fiction authors, uh, Sarah Graham, uh, the great, mm. great Sarah Graham, uh, just self published her last novel. Cause she is, you know, Sarah has always been somebody I think uh, further down the road than me, but like me who is really well thought of in crime fiction. She's a crime fiction author's crime fiction author, you know, and, uh, and I think that's had her run into trouble. I don't know her, so I'm totally speculating here that like that it kind of makes more sense for her to just go ahead and self publish. She has a great fan mm. base, and like uh, and there are people who want to buy her books, and and she can get more of the profit by self publishing. And she has enough experience to know to like you still give it a real cover. You 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 mm. copy edit it. You know she did all the work that you're supposed to do to publish a book. And then she's also famous enough that she can get press for a self-published book yeah. Um, because the right people like, like Sarah's work. So I think that is a future that I could see for a lot of people like me who aren't ever going to, even if my books are getting more commercial, I'm never going to be a, um, I'm too weird and dark for like a superstar status. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. That like right. sells a billion copies mm. kind of guy. Uh, which is yeah. fine. I mean, I'm happy with where I'm at, but like uh, I could see in the future as publishing gets narrower and narrower, more people making that choice, not just in publishing, by the way. I mean, I think in film, I think indie mm. films are going to, uh, they've always been interesting, but I think we're about to have another resurgence because I can tell you Hollywood is getting more conservative every yeah. day. And, and I don't mean that politically, although I it also politically, but like, um, but like in that, like, they just want the big stuff, you know, yeah, that's they, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and those of us who care about other things are just gonna have to like get into physical media and, 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 and supporting artists directly and, and making things, uh, directly. Mm. And, and I, I think that's the future for a lot of, uh, a lot of good art in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And I've noticed in the publishing world, there are more people taking, this hybrid publishing route where they will have like something with a big press and then they'll put something out independently. And I mean, I, I'm wondering, you've obviously said that's a route that you could 
take. Now, you said if you'd put The Last King of California out with a smaller press, that would be seen as a step down. Do you think if you were to do something with like a big publisher and then you were to independently put something out, would that have the same kind of negative stigma or potential impact? Or is it a bit of a different case when you're putting it out yourself? Here's why it, it gets really complicated it is because as more and more decision making is, is, is pushed towards algorithms, um, you start seeing these algorithmic choices where, for instance, like, you know, you publish one book that is, and, and then you come out with another book that's completely different um, and maybe feels more commercial, but there's a certain big bookstore chain that said, well, we'll take as just as many copies of this book as the last book sold. Mm. Because that's, that's just algorithmic thinking. You know, yeah. this author yeah. sells X number of copies. So that's where you get into danger if you go out with a small mm -hmm. press. Um, but if you start at a small press and, and, and then work your way up, that's a totally different vibe. It, it, I don't know mm. why, but it just is. They don't count that. But like if you were somebody who sold up here and then all of a sudden you sell down here, yeah, it doesn't matter why to the algorithm. The algorithm just says, well, this person doesn't sell as many copies as they used to. It's a very, uh, it's a very weird system. And mm. um it's why you hear all the time now, if you, if you, people are submitting to agents, um, a lot of agents will not consider people who've already been published as clients, unless they're already big successes, because a new author is an unknown quantity. There's, no, there's nothing in the algorithm to make a decision about them. You can only make a human decision about a new author. So if you, so it's actually... And this is, again, this is perverse. This is not the way the world should be. It's just the way the world is. Yeah. It's better for you as, a, as an author to have never published your first books than to have published a book and not had to be a success. Mm. Um, which weirdly, like Hollywood doesn't work that way, at least not all the time. But like in Hollywood, it's like if you've gotten a show on the air, even if it got canceled right away, it's seen, well, but they have experience getting a show on the air. So they have, that mm -hmm. must mean that they know what they're doing and we can trust them and they'll, you're more likely to get another show on the air. Uh, but uh, publishing is, is, that's one way that publishing is worse than Hollywood. Most ways publishing is better than Hollywood. But um, that one, that weird algorithmic thinking is, is very bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, unfortunately, I think there's more of a shift in all realms to algorithmic thinking and AI and these weird yeah. automated kind of decisions that are, are being made. But I mean, I, I don't know if this is a concern for you, but I, I'm not concerned about AI stories or AI art in inverted commas, you know, replacing mm -hmm. real art because it just lacks the humanity. It lacks, you know, what makes it fundamentally human so i just think you're not going to be able to replace real artists with ai because you know they're literally not human that is the missing ingredient there's no soul i, I no i i can i completely agree with that my i always say that particularly fiction but film anything uh paintings uh like art mm -hmm. exists it's a, it's a medium for one subconscious to talk to another subconscious and then our conscious mm -hmm. brains of both the creator and the consumer are just sort of like in the way of, of that basic conversation between two subconsciouses and AI literally doesn't have a subconscious. It, it does not have one. If you ask it to do something, it will deliver that thing, but there will not be any weird stuff bubbling up. And if that stuff does mm. bubble up, it's not from a subconscious. It's from some quirk in the algorithm. Yeah. I, I mean, people sometimes like, I kind of mean this literally. I find that stuff demonic. Like, what's a demon a demon is an unliving thing that mm. like mocks life and exhibits the signs of life and can get inside your head but with something that is not alive and and, and is yeah to me like that's the scary part is like putting that stuff in your head but uh, to me what the threat of ai is not taking my job or anybody like anybody's like creative art job it's just that, that it's going to start flooding the zone like like that like people are going to learn how to pair AI with chatbots that come on Twitter 
and suddenly every Twitter thread is going to be just exploded with comments and everything. I mean, you saw about, what is it, Clark's World or Clark World, the sci-fi yeah, yeah. website yes. that had to shut down because they got bombarded by AI stories. Like, yeah, the stories don't have to be good to flood the zone. They just have to flood the zone. I mean, right. I've, I've just yeah. seen, I think that's going to be a real problem. I think it's just going to increase <clears throat> the amount of noise that yeah, well, it seems I mean, like there's a, you know, if, I was just going to say, if that kind of thing happens, then a natural reaction is there's going to be less open submissions because people don't want to mm. have to deal with that. I mean, God, if I had an open submission call and I'm just getting hundreds of AI generated things, it's like, sorry, you know, invite only going forward because I'm just not going to deal with that or... I, I guess, like, you know, there's ways you could get kind of clever about it. So you almost have, like, a semi-open submission. So you'd have to have, like, some mm -hmm. email list with different writers that you know, and then you make them aware, but you don't publicly put it out there. Yeah, I mean, there's – and again, and then some – somebody somewhere's job is going to be to learn how to like bypass that or, or mm -hmm. oh, yeah. interact. Yeah. I mean, it's an arms race, you know, and uh, mm. I'm very interested because I do think that, again, I don't think it's because they're going to start writing novels that people want to read, but I do think we're at an inflection point where mm. things are going to, with the, I, the ones that I think are really funny and that I really enjoy are the, the voice emulators where they're like, right you know, doing fake Joe Biden uh, speeches or like yeah. Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro having art. I, I just yeah. laugh at those. Like, yeah. um, but really like those are going to get better. The chat bots mm -hmm. are going to yeah. get better. There's going to be whole websites that are just filled of nothing, but like people who don't exist having conversations with each other. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's really, it's going to, and it, I, again, I just feel like it's going to flood the zone and then the AI bots are going to start learning how to speak from not humans, but from other AI bots, because they're just going to be scanning the web constantly. And as more of the web is written by AI, more AI is going to learn how, and it will, it will go off into things that we cannot predict. Yeah. I, and not that, not that they're going to take over the world. I just think like we're entering mm. some, I, I do feel like we're entering a weird inflection point that we can't see the other side of yet, that we don't know where this is going to go, but it's going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think when I, on the Clark's world thing, what he said was after he shut it down was there was a lot of these, the people who were actually sending out submitting said that they genuinely needed the money. And it's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, as a writer, it's like, okay, there's a fundamental lack of understanding how publishing works. Yeah. If you, if you get your, if you, if you accept my story, if I have any story acceptance in my email, I do not have a check in that email. No, no, you know, but they, I guess, I guess because they, they, they were thinking, well, I genuinely needed the money. If you need the money that bad, McDonald's is hiring. Yeah. I mean, I know, <laughs> ins no insult to anybody, but like, that's not, that's not why you write short stories. Like if you right. get a check, yeah. terrific. Congratulations. Like I'm glad for it. But yeah, if, if that's like, that's, I mean, you know, I think maybe the last writer who pulled that off, who like really made a significant amount of money off short stories in that style mm -hmm. was Stephen King before he mm -hmm, wrote Barry. Right. Where, you know, that generation when you really could like make a noticeable difference in your income mm -hmm. as a hustling young school teacher in Maine who I believe lived in a trailer or a very yeah. small house that, and there were like porno mags that would pay you $200 in 1970s dollars to write a horror story. And mm -hmm. Stephen King was really able to like have a noticeable and I think, by the way, that's why he can write the way he can write and write as fast as he can write is because mm -hmm. he came up in an entirely different era when, like, cranking out short stories really did mean the difference between, like, a shitty dinner and a good dinner in, in his life. Yeah, right. But that was um, 40, that was 40 years ago. Um, and I don't think anybody in genre, I, and if I'm wrong about that, I, I would love to know who's done it since, but. I just think he was like at the tail end of, of that era that like started with Robert Howard um, mm. and guys like that, where it's like, no, Robert Howard really could live off writing short stories. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, again, I, it's not, I, I want people to get paid for their short stories. It's not that, but like, 
yeah, you can't, you needed the money. I don't know. I, uh, yeah. I think just that it seemed funny to say, even say that. This is, yeah. And, and, yeah. You know, I believe that the, like, I'm sure, uh, how much do those Clark's, Clark's World pay? Uh, I want to say, sure I, exactly, I think he's at 10 bro. cents a word. Yeah. It might be. Yeah, that's I mean, what I was going to guess that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what? I got to say, that's pretty decent. I didn't know anybody still paid that anymore. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah. the, 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 so, you know, that is, but again, you can't count on that because if Clark's World doesn't accept your story, then right. I don't know, I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm not in a position to like diss anybody for going out and trying to sell a story, but like, um, but I guess that's why the AIs targeted them too, right? It's like, mm-hmm. um, well, all we need to do is sell one story out of these 500 and we'll have paid for our very little time that it took to generate them because they're not writing those stories. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, well, I know that we are coming up to the time that we have together. And by coming up to the time, I mean have massively exceeded it already. But that's right. This was really fun. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, but I, I, I do want to know, like, how have your colleagues in Hollywood responded to everybody knows? Because to say, you know, that the criticism of Hollywood is scathing is perhaps even an understatement. Well, I mean, uh, quite frankly, everybody in Hollywood has really enjoyed it. They've really enjoyed yeah. it because I think they all know what I'm talking about. And that that phrase that kind of drives a lot of the book and it's become kind of the tagline of the book is nobody talks, but everybody whispers. And that is 100% yeah. true. Hollywood is most of the secrets are open secrets in one way or another. And so people know what I'm talking about. People have lived these lives. They've had this experience. Um uh, and, you know, this feeling of like having a job that is fun and rewarding, but is also in the service of something that you're not totally comfortable with and, and then causes you to interact with these incredibly powerful and incredibly toxic people is, you know, obviously everybody knows it's the most exaggerated pulpy version of that. But mm. I was portraying the standard issue Hollywood experience by in that mm. book. That is that's the underlying tone of it. So, no, I, you know. Um, I'm, you know, trying to sell it as a movie, have some news I can't uh, say about it, but like I've been taking meetings with like people all up and down, like a couple of very famous people who have like really enjoyed it in a way where I'm like, really? Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad because, um, you know, I, I do love and hate Hollywood at the same time. So it's, it is scathing, but I'm, uh, again, uh, most people in Hollywood, I think, would like to do better than they do. And we all feel trapped, like most people do in life, I think, by the system that we're a part of that constrains. And while I do think um, a lot of the book, from my secret perspective, is about how I would really like to stop working in Hollywood and just write books. If everybody would right. purchase Everybody Knows, that would help a lot in that journey. <laughs> um, but... Um, but I think a lot of people who have who've lived in Hollywood and live in the neighborhoods that I write about, it's, this is very much my L.A., which makes it very much the L.A. of a lot of people who work in Hollywood. Uh, all the mm-hmm. restaurants are real. All of the celebrity sightings are celebrities I saw in the place I saw them, you know, like so it has it, it rings true to, to people. And I'm really glad about that. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we definitely want to chat with you on the podcast again because we haven't really spoken at all about She Rides Shotgun, which is <laughs> one of my favorite novels of the last few years. But you, well, I, I'm not. I mean, this like if you want to schedule a part two for this, we can totally schedule a part two. I would love to. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, let's really easy decision. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's do that.